Hey guys, it's Kate. Welcome back to another episode of Girl Talk. So in today's episode, I have a great friend of mine, Britton Jean from Pearland, Texas. And she is absolutely one of my favorite people that I've met through conferences. You know, I've made a lot of friends throughout the years at conferences, but the friends that I made when I went to Texas are really some friends that have kind of just stayed being supportive and stayed being great friends since I met them. So I'm so privileged to know all of those girls, but especially Britt, you know, I was able to stay with her at her house and just have a great time with her that week. And during this call, she definitely spoke a lot of wisdom. And I really feel like those of you that watch this episode, you're going to learn a lot and you're going to take a lot with you through what we talked about. We talked about her testimony, her relationship story. We talked about just a lot of different things that I feel like a lot of people could really relate to and really enjoy. So I hope that you guys like this video. The connection is a little wonky at some parts, so don't mind that. As you guys know, these calls are filmed through Zoom, and so it's kind of hard to make sure that two people in two different states, two different computers, two different connections have perfect Wi-Fi and perfect quality at all times. So just, you know, please don't mind that. There are going to be a few parts that are a little wonky, but I did my best in editing to make sure that everything flows really well. So I hope that you guys enjoy this episode. I really think that you are going to take a lot with you. So without further ado, let's just get into the video. Hey guys, I'm here with my friend Britton and we are doing another episode of Girl Talk. So today we're going to talk about a few different things. Uh, we have some really good topics. So before we get into it, I just wanted to introduce you guys to Britt. So if you want to kind of introduce yourself, talk about what it is that you do, um, go ahead. I am starting up a business. So it is in the form of art, so all forms of art. Right now I'm doing... Um, paintings, commissions, interior design, and um, I'm doing Kate. So I am just trying to kind of map out a way to start this business. I've already been doing, um, I'm kind of expanding my business called Jean Gateau, which is my last name in cake in French. And um, I'm working on my name at the moment. Um, if you have any opinion on it, I have three, op actually two options. So I did have three and I put it on Instagram for people to vote. And right now my full name is what is the most popular. It's Charity Britton Jean. Um, and then CB Jean is also the second. So if you have any opinions, you could definitely comment. That would be so helpful. But I'm just trying to kind of expand some forms of art that I just thoroughly enjoy that just bring so much fulfillment to my life. And I kind of want to incorporate that to other people's lives as well. Um, I started with interior, really. I've always loved interior my entire life, um, as well as, as, you know, any form of art. I've, I've taken art classes when I was younger. Not a lot of art classes, um, but just anything with art, I was so just all in. And I just thoroughly enjoyed. And um, interiors kind of formed every time I would go to my mother-in-law's house a friend's house, I would be like, you know, this would look really good if you did this to this room. Do you mind if I do it? Like, and if you don't love it, we'll fix it and just totally redo it and scratch the whole idea. And then I would end up doing it and I'd be like, oh my gosh, I love that. Um, it was so funny. Recently, a friend of mine, a um, very close friend, I was like, sister, is there a reason that you have nothing in your living room? Like, we can go to Goodwill and we can get you some things like we could be creative. Like I want you to feel at home and this is not feeling at home with nothing in your living room. And so she was like, Britt, the only reason why I have it is because I don't know what to buy. And I was like, Oh, well, sister, let's get our iPads out. Let's, let's figure this out. I want to make this house a home for you. And honestly, I just have done it so much with my friends and family, my sister, she just bought a new home. Um, she's getting married in August. And I just would be like, you know what? We, we need to work with what you've got. And um, let's, let's make this, let's get this. She's into design as well, but sometimes she just, it's almost like when it's your house or your space with your items, you are just clueless on what to do. You run out of ideas and you're overwhelmed. You think I have to do all the things 
to make this the way I want it. When someone else can come in, take what you have and change it up a little bit. And then it's like, it's brand new, almost like an outfit. Somebody can come in your closet, pick outfit out that you would never put together. And you're like, Ooh, that looks, that looks great. You know, but, um, honestly, all these things are just something that sparks joy for me. And I just feel so fulfilled in doing it. And I want other people to feel that way as well. I want them when they're in their home. It just means so much to me that I can make someone's home space feel like when they walk in, it's a place of peace and comfort. And they're like, this is me. And I didn't know how to make it me, but now I feel like this is me and it makes me so happy. So I just have really wanted to expand this business and I do workshops and experiences online because I just, I love to share what I've learned, whether it be in ministry or a testimony of my life, things I've been through. I am an open book. I want to help people figure out how to gauge their life or their home, or if it just be sending a beautiful cake to their party. I love to help people in any way. So I feel like for me, this is a way of showing people things that I've learned along the way that have made me happy. So I long way around that, but I just, that's kind of just my thing. Like I, I want to show people that you can make your life better, whether it be eating a piece of cake or walking in your living room or bedroom and being like, this is me. Or if it is, um, you know, with art, like seeing a piece on your wall that you're, you're like, man, that just touches me when I see that. Or that's so cool. Like I love to look at that, but whatever form of art, I feel like to me, it brings life to my, to my life in a way. And, um, I just want to share that. So. Oh, I love that. Especially the piece of cake part. That's, that's good. <laughs> so great. Cake makes everything better. Like everything. <laughs> And she's amazing at making cakes. If you guys don't follow her on Instagram, you definitely should. Um, I love when you post like the sped up videos of you like making cakes and decorating. Just because I'm like not that great at, I'm not great at like decorating stuff. So I like to watch other people do a good job at that. And then Um, like when you watch it, it's like you can kind of impersonate it easier. You know, like you're like, okay, she did it, piped it this way okay let me try let's see how it goes you know like so it's it's kind of helpful in that way for sure I really like watching all your all your like videos all your like classes like little clips um thank you we actually just redid my room because I hated it I was like this space is not good and I feel like like you were saying like you if you're like in your own space and it's not like the way that you like it, it just doesn't feel, I don't know. You just don't feel Uh like happy almost. Yeah. And And comforted. Yeah. So my room was like kind of dark. So we painted it like really bright. And then we did like this brick wall over here. I love it. Thanks. When I first joined in the the Zoom call and I saw like you accidentally dropped the the thing (laughs) and I could see a few items. I was like, that looks so great. I love it. Great job, sister. (laughs) Thanks. Thanks. It was kind of like a long process. We started in like December, but I just was like gradually buying pieces and he, my dad finally finished painting it. That was kind of a hassle to get him to finish. I'm sure. I'm sure. But, painting <laughs> is like, oh man, like painting walls. Painting mm-hmm. art is like a totally different ball game, but painting walls, it's just like, oh my gosh, such a dread. But it makes yeah. the space, it totally completes the space. For sure. I made it look like a completely different room. It's so cool cool what Pete can do because it's like a cheap form of decoration. You know, like it's a $30 can of paint, maybe two of those and like, bam, your space is transformed. And it looks fresh, like, you know, new, fresh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks like a different, different space, even though it's the same. But yeah. It was cool because I I had that room for like a while. There was like a pink and green fan situation. I'm not gonna talk Everybody's about that. Everybody's had one of those. <laughs> At one point of your life, you had a pink and green or purple blue fan. <laughs> yeah, I was having this conversation with some friends the other day. Like we all apparently had the same childhood because we all had the pink and green room. <laughs> we all had the Paris room. It's like the little boxes from Home Goods that say like bonjour on them. Yeah, of <laughs> like, course. Did we? 
<laughs> that we all have the same childhood because like I thought I was unique, but apparently I was doing what everyone else was doing. Oh yeah, it was the trend. <laughs> and we didn't even yeah. know it. We didn't even know. We thought we were original. So I wanted to talk about how we met because it's kind of like a random story. Um but we met in 2018. And yes. if you guys saw my motion conference vlog, um, I was able to go to motion conference, which is a conference at First Church in Pearland. And um, I was able to stay with Britt randomly because like we had never met, but um, the person that I was kind of like going with was like, oh, you should stay with Britt. You'll have more fun with her. And I was like, okay. So I got That's to stay cool. at her I, house. I didn't even know that. That's <laughs> yeah, cool. she was like, she's like, I have kids, so it won't be as fun with me. So you, I just want you to stay with Britt so you'll have a good time. And I was like, okay, like, I hope it goes well. <laughs> she was like, it'll go well. She's like, Brooke's really fun too, so you'll have a good time. So, um, yeah, I got to stay at Britt's house for like, a long it was like five days or something it was like a long yeah. time I feel like um but I just remember thinking like you were the most like hospitable person like her house was like such like a peaceful place to stay at it was like I'm so glad thank you <laughs> you're welcome I just always like I told Nicole like whenever I would walk out of my room there was always like music playing like softly yeah. And it always smelled really good. And the, like the little Roomba was like going around all quietly. And I was like, why is this house like the most peaceful house I've ever been in before? I'm so glad. That is totally what I'm, I'm shooting for. It's peaceful. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And it was just a really fun week. Like we got our nails done. We went out for like brunch and dinner and like all these things. Had lots of girl talk. So it was oh, a really yes. good time. I um, thoroughly enjoyed it. I did too. So I feel like now, like with you and then with, with her sister, um, Brooke, <laughs> and like our other friends, we just made like a lifelong like friendship, which was, yeah. which was really cool. Because I was like Most younger definitely. than everybody else at the time. I was like 18 or 19 at the time. Oh, so yeah. I was like, yeah, I was like, <laughs> I hope I'm not like the baby of the group. I was so nervous for some reason because I'm usually really? going to stuff with my family, but I yeah. was like by myself. So I was like, oh gosh, I hope, I hope I don't say like <laughs> something awkward or something like that. And if you did, we are forgiving, loving people. We, I'm, <laughs> I'm sure that there are times I've said things that are awkward. Happens all the time. No judgment here, it's, sister. It is possible. I haven't heard you say anything awkward, but we'll go with it. <laughs> <laughs> I have. I have. Stick along. <laughs> Stick around. <laughs> I wanted you to talk about like your relationship story, kind of like how you guys um, met <laughs> or how you started dating. Um, we talk about that kind of stuff on this series all the time, just because I do have like a lot of younger or like teenage girls that watch. And so, um, I think it's important to just talk about godly relationships and yeah. just, yeah, just talking about your own stories. I don't know. I just like hearing them. So, well, thank you. I will start off with how we met. Um, Lavelle was an intern at my church in Louisiana for about three months. And um, it's so funny. Every time I start the story, he was significantly older than me and I was quite young. We, um, did not like even think about dating at that time. It was just, I just met him at that time. So, um, at my church, um, in Alexandria, he had was talking to my youth pastor and my youth pastor at the time was like a huge father figure in my life. Um, we were very close. Um, he had been my youth pastor from my junior high youth pastor. And when I moved up to high school, he was my high school youth pastor. So, um, he was just so great. And um, I was walking past at the campgrounds and he was like, you're not going to talk to me. But I saw that he was talking to my husband. Now I saw I was talking to Lavelle and at POA, we all called him Levi. Like that was his nickname. So most people, when he came back, like Jonathan Dean, our um, worship pastor now at, at first church, he um, came in the office and was like, where's Levi? And 
they were like, who is Levi? But Lavelle wanted just a normal name. So he told everybody at um, the internship, like, they were like, do you have a nickname? He was like, yeah, Levi, you guys can call me Levi. So um, it's just a funny joke that we're all like, Lavelle, Levi, whoever you are, you know. So anyway, um, I was like, well, you're talking to this guy. So I didn't want to interrupt you. And he was like, well, this is Brit. This is Levi, Levi, this is Brit. And I thought in my head, like, I know who that man is, that good looking man that everybody knows who he is. Like, I know who he is. You don't have to tell me who he is. I'm checking up on that man. But it's really funny. So I was 14 at that time and he was 22. <laughs> Oh but like, God. again, like we never even remotely, yeah, there was nothing there. I do remember when he graduated the internship though, I saw him down, like I was up in the risers and I saw him and I was like, man, like I could never have someone like that. Like just a beautiful, like looks like he has it all together. Fabulous man, like style on point, like all the things like beautiful man. And I just thought like, I, I could never have somebody like that. And, um, two years later at, because of the times I was singing in the choir and I saw him like in the crowd, like praying and crying. And I was just like, man, like that is, there is nothing more attractive than a praying man, you know, <laughs> like mm -hmm. in Louisiana, like we didn't have very many guys to choose from. I am so picky. I have a standard and like, I'm not. I'm not going down on it. Like, so I didn't really find many guys that would reach a standard that I desired. So I just wouldn't even give them a lot of day, but to see a guy worshiping, I'd be like, you know, I need to figure out, I need to figure out how I can get a man like this. So actually that night, uh, friends, so all of my friends growing up were so much older than me. Um, my brother was eight years older than me. And then my cousin was four years older than me. So I hung out with their friends. So we went to a restaurant and I like Le Levi at the time, Lavelle was there. And, um, he asked me or there, we were talking or something. And then somebody was like, yeah, she's a twin. And he was like, so just taken that I was a twin. And I was just like, I get this all the time. Like, yeah, whatever, you know? But he just kept on like, I can't believe you're a twin. And I was just like, yeah, I'm a twin. Like, <laughs> okay. You know, well, my, uh, you know, someone, I'm not going to say noticed that, um, he was taken a liking to me apparently and kept talking to me and was like, you do know that she's 16, right? He was completely thrown. Like she, she, she's what she's how old? <laughs> like what? 16. What? You're kidding you're not 16. And I was just like, just, well, I was so mad at that girl. I was like, Ooh, girl, you made me so mad. I was loving on this man. And he just was loving <laughs> on me. And mm, you just ruined it. So anyway, it's so funny. The next night we go after church, we went to a restaurant and I go, I was a little late and I went to like sit at the table. There were no seats. So he like, such a gentleman like goes and gets a chair from another table and sits it down right beside his. So he apparently wasn't that <laughs> upset that I was 16. Um, anyway, so I think he was like 24 at the time, something like that, 23, 24. And, um, yeah, probably 23. So anyway, I, um, was sitting at the table and literally the whole time we didn't talk to anybody but each other and just all his like, desires, likes, hobbies were mine. And we, it was like, we were the same person. And I remember in that conversation, like, I'm going to marry this man. Like he's it. I am madly in love with this man. And I don't even know who he is. I don't know much oh. about him, but I'm in love with this man, like in love, head over heels, knockout, like totally. So after that, um, I just like, it was really funny. I <clears throat> thought, you know what? I just, I have got to pray and fast and just, I just was in love with him. So I went to Houston, um, in April, that was in January. And so in April for my birthday, I went with a few friends to Houston to visit Houston and visit our girlfriends that were in Houston. But Lavelle was also in Houston. He happened to be the same friends as these other friends as well. So it worked out really well. Um, but we went to this restaurant and like, 
I remember somebody saying like, oh, where's Lavelle and so-and-so? And I was thinking, oh, his sister, you know. <laughs> and then they were like, oh, I, I don't even know if they're together. You know how they are. They're always on and off. And I was like, hold up a hot minute. Like, I thought I'm marrying this man. He's with someone. I went to the bathroom. <laughs> I literally just was sobbing, crying. Like, lost it. Like, my heart was completely crushed. Just about had it. A friend walks in the bathroom. And I was like, oh, girl, these contacts are killing me. I just can't even take these things. You know, and like, it was just really funny, really funny. So after that, and I couldn't even look at him like the rest of that trip. Cause I just was in love with him. And I think that his woman knew that I was in love with him too. Cause she just didn't seem to like me very much. Um, and I like, wouldn't talk to him. I wouldn't look at him. I would talk to everybody else, act like he wasn't there, but I just couldn't help it. Like I love that man. So Anyway, um, and he kept picking on me the whole time that I was there. And I was just like, I wish you would just leave me alone and go be with your woman that you with, you know, like leave me alone, quit messing with me. So I, um, I went home and I was so crushed. I said, you know what, Lord, I just turned 17. I am dedicating from 17 to 18 to you. I'm not dating anybody. I don't want to see anybody. Like I don't want to date. I am going to just be fast a certain amount of days a week and then fast certain things for a whole year. Fast men. I'm not doing this. Like I, if I love him this much, like, and I don't even know him, I just want what your will is. And I just kept seeking God's will. And one time I was at, um, ladies conference in Louisiana and somebody was preaching and was saying something, you know, to really pray for the things that God has called you to do. And when I, I felt to pray those things, like I just heard God say, like, you're going to be a preacher's wife and you're going to marry LaVal. And I was like, oh, that was just me. Like that had to be just me. So I go home. It was a Friday night. Like none of my friends answered the phone. My own mom didn't even answer the phone. My sister didn't answer the phone. And I was like, this is Friday night. And I'm by myself. I was by myself at a ladies conference. None of my friends wanted to go to a ladies conference on a Friday night. I mean, I was young, so not, that wasn't their thing at the time. Um, but anyway, like I went home and I turned a sermon on. I was like, oh, I may as well listen to a sermon. So I put on this sermon and I can't remember who it was. Maybe it was Joel Osteen or somebody, but they said something like, don't belittle the word from the Lord that you heard. What God spoke to you is like literally just said that. And I was like, oh, Lord, help me, Jesus. <laughs> Please help me, Lord. So like, I just kept, I would dream about him all the time and I'd be like, this is too much. Like I'm cut. And I would go to Houston. He would still be with this girl. Um, one time, like this person before that had said I was 16 to him, she liked him as well. Um, left me. So I drove to Houston by myself and ended up staying with Lavelle's girlfriend at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so how this happened was, um, a friend of mine was really close friends with him. And he was like, these girls ditched her because they, I don't think they want her to come. Like for, you know how girls are, girls can be quite mean, like just so mean when it involves a man. So, um, I just <laughs> was like, you know, I had nowhere to stay. I was broke. I was in high school and this girl, his girlfriend, was 10 years older than me, had a master's degree in teaching. And I was like, what do you, what, what do I even have to offer? <laughs> like, <laughs> what am I, you know, like I'm in high school and I work at a rock climbing gym. Like I'm a ballet instructor, <laughs> you know, like I have nothing to offer. Like she does, you know, my life is not together. So anyway, I'm like living on a prayer on this Houston trip, <laughs> driving by myself. And so I like stayed with her, like Lavelle convinced his girlfriend to let me stay with her after my friend had talked to him, like, can you believe so-and-so did this to her? Like, that's so messed up. You need to let, you need to talk, figure out a way where we can like let her stay somewhere. And so he talked to his girlfriend. She was not excited about the idea at all, but you know, was very kind person and let me do that. So we had a conversation while I was staying with her and she always called me friend. 
She's like, hi, yeah. friend. I so, hate that. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was, you know. So um, she was just like talking about some things about, you know, a guy that she had dated for like 10 years. And I was like, you know, it just wasn't God's will. And she was like, well, you never know God's will. And I was like, girl, you better know God's will because I want your man. You better know <laughs> God's will. If you want that other guy, you better go with him because I want your man. Like, you better get it together. Like, the Lord's telling me that I'm going to marry him, but you're in the way. So you get out the way. I'm kidding. <laughs> it, not really. But anyway, really. So, so it's so funny. I had come again to Houston. I know this is a really long story. It is a long story. Kind of wrap no, it I up. like hearing it. No, I like hearing it. It's fine. Well, thank you, sister. So... I was at general conference in Houston and there's like 10,000 people there. I was praying by myself again. I was by myself a lot during this time. Um, it led me really close, closer to the Lord. Um, but I was praying really hard and just crying like, God, I am so tired of like coming here, seeing him. And every time I would come around, like his girlfriend would talk about them getting married. So I was just like, you know what? I'm so tired of, of hearing that he's your will for my life and nothing is like progressing at all. It seems like his other relationship is progressing. So if it, if he really isn't your will and it was just me really getting wrapped up, up into this, like, please don't let me see him at all at this conference. Like, please don't let me run into him. Please don't let me see him. Like, I just, I can't, I can't take it. But if he is, Lord, please let me run right into him. I turn around, like, with tears, just, like, running down my face, like, ugly tears. And I literally turn around, and he walks up to me and asks me a question from the, the oh, restaurant God. when I was 16. And I, we, like, where we, like, sat and talked for a while, and we were just talking to each other. And I just literally was like, you've got to be kidding. Like, this and then we as we're talking well we walk up to the center of general conference and somebody um said something like oh yeah there's so and so his girlfriend with so and so the guy that she had dated 10 years they're engaged and I, you when my heart heard that i literally <laughs> could have done a praise break right in the middle of that hall like i could care less who was there i was like oh jesus you know, like, look, could you answer my prayers? Because I'm telling you what, I prayed for her. God's will for my life for a year, God's will for Lavelle's life, and God's will for her life. Because I she, I didn't want her to be unhappy either. So I <laughs> prayed for her. I prayed for her all the time. And um, it was so funny. But when I heard that, I was just like, oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You find my battles for me. But anyway, like, it just, and from then on, like, it was so funny. I never called him never like after that he called me randomly I think it was like a week or two later and was just like hey do you remember that song that was playing in that restaurant we were all at and I was like Stevie King and his eyes and he was like, <laughs> I remember he asked me to shazam a certain song and I was like I am never gonna forget this song like never because you were talking to me and the Lord told me you was it and this is happening I won't get this song and but I was just like nonchalant oh yeah um I think it was and then I was like I know what song this is but anyway like he just <laughs> happened to call me to ask about the song and then started talking to me for a while like two hours and we would just literally talk like all night about our dreams and the things that we wanted to do for the Lord and just passions that we had and it was just like from then on out like again I never called him ever because I was like okay, I'm in love with you, but I need to know if it's, this is reciprocated. Like, I don't want to be into someone that's not into me. So I ain't calling you. You can call me, you know, like, I want to know, like, if you like me that way. So, and his friend, it was so funny. It was such a big role in this, like his best friend. Um, he would be like, you seriously, because Lavelle was very hung up about my age. He was like, I've always said I would never date a younger girl. Never. Like, they want to play games. You know, I'm not about that. So, um, he just, that was such a thing, like, that I was so young, you know. Um, and he just, that was a hang up. But his best friend was like, you have no idea, like, who this girl is. Like, she's a great person. Like, she, the things she's told me that God has told 
her about you. Like, like you guys are like the same person. And he also would have dreams about me and Laval being together. So it was just like really crazy how he was such a catalyst to our relationship. Um, but either way, like it just, it, God just really unraveled it because I have prayed my whole life for God's will for my life since I was five years old. Um, my dad left us when we were like born pretty much. I've never lived with my dad. Um, but I knew he was supposed to be there. So like every night we would call him and beg him to come home. And, um, when we were five, like he set us aside and was just like, I'm never coming home, you know? So, so stop asking. Like, it's, it's not that I don't love you. I'm just not, I can't do it. I can't come home. I'm sorry. So, um, and I, every birthday I would wish for him to come home until I was five. And then at five, I was just like, okay, Lord, like, I don't want what my mom went through. This has been so hard. Like, and my mom is still a single mom and she's 40 something years old. Um, so it's like, actually, no, she's not. She's 52. I'm sorry. My poor mom. <laughs> She just, she doesn't ever tell her age much. So she always acts like she's younger than she is. So, um, anyway, um, it's just like, I mean, I knew how hard that was. That was a very hard life. It was very hard on us. It brought us so much pain that it's unless you've like been abandoned, fatherly abandoned, or maybe it's for somebody else's motherly abandoned. You just can't understand like forever. There's a huge hole and missing peace in your life forever. It never goes away. And you can think that you're fine, like you're over it. And then something will happen in your life and you're like, man, this still hurts. Why? Like, why does this still hurt? Because it's just, unless you've been through it, like you just can't understand. It's, it's just something that is stuck with you for the rest of your life. And so it's just like, I knew I, I want the right person in my life. Like I don't want my children to ever feel the way I feel every father's day. We would cry all the time. Like we could barely even sit through a service. And so I just, I never wanted that for my children. I never wanted that for my life to feel so incomplete as my mom did, you know, and, um, insecure, and just so many things that come along with being abandoned, being cheated on, being run around on, you know, I did not, I didn't want that for my life. And so I knew, you know, either God can place the right person in my life and I can make the right decisions because my mom just did not know how to pick a good man. So, um, I was kind of just talking about how, just how important it was for me to, pray and fast and pick the right person. Um, because I feel like you can have faith that God will place someone in your life, but faith, faith without works is dead. Mm -hmm. So you have to do something to have the faith that you have that God will bring someone into your life, but you have to do something for it to birth something beautiful. You know, um, I feel like there are people that you choose and things that you do that can really get in the way of what God wants to do in your life. And so I just knew that every action that I made with the guys that I dated or um, people that I surrounded myself around would alter my future. You know, it had the power to alter my future. It had the power to help my future or hinder my future. So mm -hmm. I really, really was adamant about surrounding myself with people that would lift me up and lift up the purpose that God had for my life. And if there were actions that they made um, that did not align with what I felt like God was doing in my life, then I would just separate myself from them. Um, <clears throat> and I will say in dating, um, I've always had a boyfriend my whole life because I was so afraid to be alone like my mom. And I, didn't really choose the best either. You know, I felt like looks are a huge thing to me. Um, so like it actually, I picked like my perfect man list before I met Laveau. He was everything on it, like down to the shoes 
like his foot size. It creeps me out when guys' feet are the same size as their their girlfriend's or spouse's feet. Like, I don't know why I'm so weird like that. But it's just weird to me. So, like, my husband has a size 12 shoe. <laughs> so, like, he definitely doesn't have small feet. Um, and then, like, so funny, like, white teeth are such a thing to me. And he, like, every time he smiles, people call him the shark off of Nemo, Bruce, because he's, like, got this big, white, bright smile. Like, so funny. Um, I mean, just all kinds of things that I put on this list, like, just he checked off, you know. But before him, I remember setting, like, a goal for myself um, to stay pure you know, until I was married. And, um, that was so important to me. Um, growing up the way I did, my mom wasn't in church and just, you know, it, I wanted that for my life. That was so important to me. And in any relationship I dated, I'm not a perfect person. I have not been a perfect person. I'm not going to say that I've been a perfect person, but I had goals for myself that I would never, ever, ever, let down. And no matter how tough of a situation that I've gotten in, I said, I will never cross this line and I will not do it. You're not worth it. You're not worth my future. You're not worth things that you're attaching to my life because of a moment of desire and a moment of pleasure. Like, you know, the scripture talks about like pleasure being momentary, you know, and it's just like choices that you make right now and your relationships matter so much for the rest of your life, forever. And that person that seems so irresistible at the time, I promise you, five years down the road, 10 years down the road, 20 years down the road, you're going to be like, what in the world did I see in that person? Like, oh, I was head over heels for that guy. And it's like, oh, Jesus, he's horrible now. Like, I mean, <laughs> I can tell you every single one that I thought was "Mm, that man, like, Ooh, got me chills. No, no, not anymore. Like old, fat, bald. Like I'm like, what in the world was I seeing in this person or a slob, you know, like anyway, (laughs) trust me, they are never worth your goodness. Like Mm -hmm. you are wonderful and precious women, girls, like, what you have to offer, like it's a thing that least than what you have to offer on your wedding day. There's nothing, nothing at all. And I just wanted so badly to be this pure, godly woman. And, and it just meant so much to me. When, but when I walked, up, walked down the aisle and I knew that white dress was true, that meant so much to me. And I thought like, I made it, I made it through this. It hasn't always been easy, but I made it to this day. I made it walking down this aisle and it, there's no, no greater feeling than that. None. And knowing that my husband was the only man, you know, no greater feeling than that. No greater feeling. And it's so worth it when you stop and you look and there were guys that I dated a guy one time. I've always dated an older guy. I dated a guy um, that was significantly older than me. And he was not a good guy in my life. And I knew that I, I still would never cross lines, but he still wasn't a good influence in my life. And... I remember one time, but the fact that that was what was on his agenda, I just knew like, I have got to get out of this relationship, but I felt trapped. I don't know what it is about someone that has been abandoned by their father. It's very, there are so many statistics that show like when you are in a place to like in that situation where you just don't know how to get out of it. Like you don't feel worthy enough to have anything better and you don't feel worthy enough to get out of it. You feel like you have to stay trapped in this. And my youth pastor walked up to me at church. 
I counseled with my youth pastor since I was in junior high. Like I read in scripture when I was a little girl that there's wisdom and safety in the multitude of counselors. And um, I just would, I went to him in, in junior high and I just always would just, I felt like I needed to stay in counsel with him and talk to him about things that affected my life. And so we grew a very close relationship, but that day in um, church, he walked up to me and was like, Brett, you need to break up with your boyfriend. And I just sobbed crying. And I was just like, Oh, I will. Like I, I absolutely will. But it's just like, I just need somebody to just tell me like, do it. Like you need to do it because I just didn't feel like I could for myself. And he was so much older so it was almost like a domineering thing. In a way. Um, he wasn't abusive, but it's just been abused before. Um, and so I just, you know, I went up to him and because I was so much younger, I don't know if he expected that, but I just, I told him, you know, it was over. It was such an odd situation. Like he even like, I, I left and was like, no, it's over. And he, came to my house and was like crying this 25 year old man crying okay um yeah crying to like get back together with me and it's like in that moment I knew like either you're gonna like have a momentary place where you feel like someone needs you because you want to feel needed like when you've been abandoned you you want somebody to need you and to want you and to fill that void. And I thought either I can fill that void now or I can move on. So I did. And I mean, I was 16 years old, you know, what in the world would a 25 year old guy like be crying over a 16 year old girl, you know, like newsflash, not the best option. So anyway, I moved on from that. And it's just like each time I would just, the boyfriend before like just was not a good influence either would try to push the lines. And every time I would just be like, this is not me. I'm sorry. This isn't me. I'm not going to be this way. I, I refuse to, if you set goals for yourself and you make lines that you say, I will not cross, I'm not going to cross it. It will actually keep you from how I get. Okay. So like a guardrail, if you're on a bridge and there's a guardrail and here's the ledge, if you'd have a goal that's way out here and a line that you will not cross here, you'll never jump over the ledge if you do kind of get close to that line. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like you yeah. can't fall off a cliff if your lines and your guardrails are way in. And so because I had such a close line in, I would be like, okay, well then I'm going to, because I don't want to hit this guardrail, I'm going to come in even more. So it's just like it, when you have those lines for yourself, it just really helps you as a person know that I am worth more than this. God deserves my best and this isn't my best be doing those things. So anyway, and it's funny, like I would never have broken up with that guy. Um, but I found out that he had cheated on me. And so like, I of course was just like, bye. Like you can quit mm -hmm. crying. You ruined it. No, like I'm not coming back to this and tried to like come back to it. But it's like, God always stopped it every time because God gives you the desires of your heart. And the desire mm -hmm. of my heart was to be pure. And the desire of my heart was to do what was right. And God knew mm -hmm. that. And so every single time, even if I wanted to like go make out with a boy in elementary. Like, you know, like I always did it older guys. So they were junior high and it like anytime that I would want to even go do that. Cause they would call me and whatever my boyfriend, God literally would shut it down every time again, because it's like, he protects you. God protects mm -hmm. the righteous and he's going to protect you. If he knows the desires of your heart are pure. And again, I'm not a perfect person. I have not been a perfect person, but God has, held me and he has kept me from so many things. And I, I look back in my life and I'm like, I wanted to do certain things. And it's like, God, why did you protect me? Why did you shut it down every time? Why do I have this story? Cause I do not deserve this story. I don't deserve to say that I walked down with a white dress on and it was true. I don't deserve that, but you kept me every time. And so that's just something 
to any young girl or even someone that just isn't married yet. Like do not ever drop your goals. Don't drop the lines, stay at them. They are so worth it. So worth it. I love that. Um, it's always been like very important to me as well, you know, to be pure and to make sure that I can say that on my wedding day as well. And I feel like that's not really, it's not really common anymore in this society, no. even with Christians, it's hard to say no, especially because everything is so, um, you know, live in the moment and, you yeah. know, live for right now and all that stuff. And it's like, I feel like young people don't really think about their futures in a lot of the decisions that they make. Yeah. And so it's almost like, you know, being in the church, being like the one that's still pure, mm -hmm. um, rather than being like one of the many, it's almost like you're the weird one because you didn't do it. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. Um, I remember that. Even though it was forever ago, I feel like I still remember that. I was yeah. always the weird one. And it's almost like it's, you're the, the bad one because you, yeah. haven't, done because you haven't done anything. Right. Yeah. But it's like, but to the world, like, of course it is. Even certain Christians, like it's Christian really is just a title sometimes in people's life. And it's like, I'm not asking to be I'm not saying that I'm a perfect person. I'm not saying I have it all together, but I have standards for my life. Christian mm -hmm. is Christ like, and that's yeah. what my goal is. My goal is not to meet your standard and to make you happy and to make mm -hmm. you feel better because you have lowered your life standards. That's mm -hmm. not my goal. Enough. At the end of the day, I'm going to be in front of Jesus and say, I want to hear well done. That is my goal in my life is to hear well done. Not you're not going to be standing there with me. Like it's going to be me by myself. So I don't care what you think. This is my life. This is my goals. I'm not looking down on you for yours, but this is my life. So if you don't, if you have a problem with it, then you're really not a good friend to me. So it's like, yeah. see you later sister, you know? Yeah, I agree. And it's always like, yeah, like you were saying, it's almost like you're doing something wrong, you know, because I think it, stems from just people feeling guilty because they can't say yeah. that and they Mr. feel Love's company right they they feel you know kind of convicted or whatever because you made this goal for yourself and it was important to you but to them it wasn't and so they kind of feel like guilty talking about it and I understand you know everybody makes mistakes like we've talked about this um many times on on girl talk before with different people just about how everyone has their own testimony you know some people are meant to go through a lot of things to learn to trust god whereas some people maybe they don't have to go through a lot um and so i'm thankful that i didn't have to go through a lot but um i think that some people maybe they need to go through those things to learn um right you know because they feel like they want to like trust on their own understanding better than what God has for them. Right. And so, yeah, I remember when I was in Texas, I was having a conversation with someone and, um, and we were talking about this kind of stuff and they were like, they're like, what do you mean you haven't kissed a boy? You're 19. And I'm like, okay, it's not that no one hasn't tried. <laughs> like, it's yeah, just exactly. that I've just never, I don't know. I just didn't want to, you know, like I didn't feel like this is the right person that I want to give this to. I always felt like it was more important than just giving it to some random person at like a party for a dare or something, you know? And yeah. it's like, that's always been so weird, you know? And I'm like, I don't think it's weird, you know? Um, no, it is. I, it's not yeah. At all. I feel like it, you know, making these boundaries for yourself, it saves you from a lot of heartache. And so, right. yeah, I think it's really important to talk about that, you know, because I feel like there's, there's like almost two sides of the spectrum. It's like you're either starting out with doing all these things when you're young and, you know, you're being encouraged by your friends or it's like, you're not doing anything and, and that's still not the right thing, you know? So it's just, right. it's hard, but it's definitely an important 
it's definitely an important thing to talk about, um, especially yes. to young women, because it's almost like we, I, I think it's been like scientifically proven, but you know, like women are a lot more emotional than men. And so a lot of times like we'll use those like physical um, relationships and, and kind of make them like this emotional attachment when that's yeah. not what it is for the other person, you know? Right. So like we get our feelings and our emotions invested. Like you were saying, when you had to break up with this guy, you were just so sad and crying. And it's like, how many times have like all of us girls had to do something like that where we're just like so attached to this guy. And then you find out he wasn't even being faithful to you or, you know, he didn't even care about you to begin with. So it's like, um, yeah, I, I feel like, um, not partaking in a lot of things almost it just helps to guard your heart so you don't have to go through all these things that you know end up hurting you in the long run absolutely <clears throat> absolutely totally agree I think you kind of dove into it a little bit when you were talking about your relationship but um if you just kind of wanted to talk about you know like your personal testimony a little bit um whatever you want to say about that we'd love to hear about it yeah. Um, well, like I said, you know, I grew up without a father figure, um, and it just affected me so much. Like I said, it's, it's something that you really can't explain unless you've been through it. Um, and I just, I think that it just made me feeling like something was wrong with me in a way. And, um, I always felt like I could never, be myself because myself wasn't good enough. Like my dad left because there was something wrong with me. And when that wasn't the case, you know, him and my mom just, they couldn't get along. Um, and so I just, I never would be myself. Like I would always try to be like somebody else and I'm an identical twin. So I am like someone else, you know, like have the same DNA as somebody else. But like, I just, would always, if it was my friend, like I would talk like her. I had a friend that was from Canada and I just, I, sometimes I would get annoyed by the way she would say things. Um, and I still would talk like her or I hated the dresses she wore, hated them. And I would wear the dresses like her. I just constantly was like a copycat because I felt like I did not want to be myself. Like there, you are a messed up person. So be somebody else, like be anybody else but yourself. And then when I met Lavelle, I realized if God made him for me, then I am what he wants. And so I thought, I don't even know who I am. Like, what if I'm doing things that he doesn't want because I'm not being me? Like, I don't know what I like. I don't even know my favorite color because I've had a favorite color of my best friend's favorite color. Like, I don't know who I am. And so I just started like finding myself and, and trying to figure out who I am and what I like and just diving into who is this girl, you know? And so I just, after that, like I realized, and now like, even now I love to do things that makes me feel like me. I have been, I like to be unique. I don't want to be a cop. Like I can't stand being a copycat. Like I won't even do certain trends because someone else has done it. Or if house things, like if somebody else said it, because I have grown to realize, like, I love to be uniquely me. And if someone doesn't like that, that's fine with me. Like I'm not, everybody's going to love me. I'm not going to love everybody. You know, like I love everybody, but the way they do something is not always going to make me spark joy, you know, like it's not always going to make me super happy to see the way they do something. So I'm fine with that. But what I'm not fine with is transforming myself into whoever anybody is, you know, and not being authentically me. And so I've been on a journey really to just be myself. And it's so funny, like with my clothes or my home, like one day I was just like, I hate my decorations. This is not what I like at all. Like I don't like this. Why am I doing it? Like, so, and this was recently, it's so funny. And then I was like, I hate my pajamas. This isn't me. This isn't even something I would wear. Like I buy it because it's from 
Victoria's Secret or Target and they have the softest pajamas, but I hate these pajamas. Like, I don't like them. Why am I wearing them? So I gave them to my sister and my friends and I was just, cause I am like the pajama queen, like have 50 pairs of pajama pants. Like I just love, first thing I get home and I'm like, I'm putting on my PJs. So anyway, if you wear a skirt all day and you're like, that's, I just need to wear some pants. So anyway, um, <laughs> I need to be comfortable. So I just started like being like, okay, you know what, what is me then? Like, what do I love? Like, what is my style right now? Cause it's changing. Like everything changes. Like what, it, what makes me happy? And so I've just really been on this journey and it's been a long time of just not always doing what I have done before. Like even outfits, like I'm not going to pick out this outfit because this skirt has always gone with this, sh this shirt. Like, no, I'm not going to do that every day. I want to be fresh and wear something that I didn't wear the other day, you know, like always all the time. Like, am I doing this because it's easy and convenient or am I being fresh and cute and in style? Like what, what am I doing? You know? So, um, anyway, that's, that's kind of been a journey for me. And then I would say, um, my journey kind of into a deeper relationship with God when I was in high school, um, growing up, I was a cheerleader and in all the things like student council, president of my class, like anything like extrovert, like I was going to do it, you know, in every club involved in every club, like high up, you know, just always wanting to be like all the things. And then my freshman year, I realized, you know, I just kind of was like, I wanted to consecrate myself more. I wanted a deep relationship with God and I just wanted, I joined the choir. So at church and, um, I've always been raised in church, but like, I, you know, would always push the buttons with skirt length or, you know, like, again, I had the longest skirt in the, on the church squad, but it still was short, you know, like, and I thought that was a step up for me. Um, you know, like I never listened to like certain music they would listen to. Like at practice, I would be singing Christian music in my head. And that was a step up for me, you know, but I wasn't really sold out in a way. So my freshman year, I just like was trying to fit in, be all the things. And then I realized my sophomore year after joining choir for a year, like it made like we had certain length for our sleeves, skirts all that stuff and doing all that stuff. It made me like, I guess hunger for those things to be modest and to do what was right. And, um, I really got involved on the music team, which really helped me, um, move forward. So I feel like when you find out who you are in the ministry and in your walk with God, it pushes you to be a better you and to do things better. And that next year I quit the cheerleading squad. Um, Oh, I remember this is so funny. My sister and I was in a beauty pageant at our school. And, um, one of the pageants was the same night because of the times. And again, we were in the choir. So I was like, they said, if you don't come to this practice, then you're out. And I said, fine, bye. I need to leave. I'm going to miss because of the times. And it wasn't worth it for me. So I feel like that to me, that moment was a catalyst to push me to do more things in church than I was in school. And so I just kept getting so involved. And what's so funny when I got, we literally just made it in time, right? When we got, I mean, rushing from our practice to the church, I went up to the risers, got in the choir loft and the lights came on and I just lifted my hands and just sobbed crying because I knew like, this is where I'm supposed to be. This is what I'm created for. This is what I'm called to do. So um, that was a big catalyst for me in high school. And, um, after that, just getting so involved at church, like I had the most incredible youth ministry. I am so indebted to them. Um, growing up, my mom worked all the time. She was, um, a night nurse, um, RN. So we were left at home a lot. And, um, every mm -hmm. Sunday morning, Sunday night and Wednesday, we would call people to come pick us up. And so, I just, until I could drive, like we, our youth ministries and kids ministries, I don't, I would not be who I am without those people. 
like to this day, I am completely indebted to them for picking me up and taking me home. You know, it, it may have seemed like such a small thing to them, but it completely changed my life. And, you know, I'm a pastor's wife of a church that I'm so honored to be a part of, and I am indebted to to those people. I would not be here without those people. I remember like in elementary school, like I've always loved church. I have loved church my whole life. I remember one time my mom was sick with the flu and, um, I, she wasn't able to go to church and I was crying so hard. I think I was like seven years old that she called my uncle and was like, please take this baby to church. She just wants to be at church because honestly it was the only place that I have I could feel peace and complete joy and a happiness and completeness because I was so broken just so broken and lost um just from my home life you know not being able to have a father figure there and um like every birthday your dad not calling you and you hoping they call or even come to your birthday and it just it messes you up in a way you know and, and you always feel like you're a faulty item like something's wrong with you. So I just, um, like church was my place where I could literally just fall at the feet of Jesus and feel the love that I so longed for and the peace that I so longed for. And, um, my mom, some, a really big piece of my life. Um, my mom dated this guy when I was nine. Um, he, she met him in the church and he wasn't, really a good person, honestly. Um, he was new to the church and had just gotten in church, but he was a very good looking man. And that was my mom's like struggle. She would get a good looking man, but just would not be anything of what she needed. Well, I was nine and God sent me a dream about this man. And I told my mom, I was like, mom, something's wrong with him. Like, I'm telling you, if you stay with him, he's going to ruin our life. I really feel that. And, um, that day that I had the day before that I dreamed that and told my mom that we went to a snow con stand. I will never forget. I was so young, but I remember seeing him and it's like my little spirit could discern that something wasn't right with him. And I just knew like, he's not a good man. Something's wrong. And I told my mom that, and it's like, she, again, when you're abandoned, you just feel trapped. And like, you, you, you have to stay in this. There's no way out. And that was my mom's situation. And so for six years, he abused my mom, punched her out of a car, um, tried to put a hot iron on her. And I'm so grateful that he never touched us, you know, um, never hurt us. I feel like he was almost afraid to, and I believe that was the Lord, you know? Um, but it's just growing up and I would counsel my mom at nine, <laughs> you know, like what does a nine year old have to counsel until like two and three in the morning and have to get up for five thirty, you know, for school. I got myself up ever since I was in first grade every day. We got ourselves up, picked our clothes out, got dressed. Like we raised ourselves. So, um, I, my youth pastors and youth leaders realized like we would cry every time they were on their way to take us home. Like, please, can we just stay with you or can we go somewhere? And so I think they kind of realized something wasn't right. Um, because we just hated to be home. My mom and her boyfriend fought all the time. And I remember we would call holidays holidays because I mean, they would fight so bad. One time we were on our way to Christmas and, um, I think my mom was like, we're turning around. Like we're not even going to go. And I just remember sobbing and just screaming. Like, I hate y'all. I hate y'all so much. You are horrible. Like you are horrible. I hate y'all so much. I hate living with you. I hate this life. Y'all are horrible. And like, as a child, like telling them they can't go to Christmas and see all of their family. Like I was so devastated. Like stuff like this would happen all the time. And I just felt like trapped and just in this home life that was such turmoil and such pain and, you know, just so awful. Like we never wanted to come home. And so, and I would fall asleep in class. Like, and finally my teacher was like, baby, why are you always falling asleep? And we told her what was going on. And so anytime, you know, we would be falling asleep, she would be like, you're done with your work. Just take a nap, put your head on your desk, you know? And I was so grateful for that. 
Um, I'll never forget that teacher that year, but it just really affected us so much because um, just growing up in such turmoil all the time, it's just, it's hard to be a stable person, I guess, when, when you grow up that way. And um, my, you know, unfortunately, my mom struggled really as well with, she was being abused and her level of discipline struggling with knowing what was too much and what wasn't, you know, enough in discipline. And it just was very, very hard to deal with that as well. And so I just, sometimes I would just text my youth pastor and be like, I can't take this. Like, I really can't take this anymore. Like I, I've hit a breaking point and I don't know how to get through this. And I just constantly would stay in counsel with my youth pastor and he helped me so much because I just felt like so like my whole, I just was in utter turmoil all the time. And so I just tried to get involved as I could at church and find a haven there. And so I just soaked up in, in, in my relationship with God. Like I remember being a little girl and I just felt like I need to pray. So I would go upstairs and put a big t-shirt on, put my hair down and just pray. And I feel like God, throughout all of this, he raised me, you know, he taught me how to pray. I remember being at the altar and being like, you need to pray more. Like you need to stay here longer. And, and it just like, it literally just helped me so much. And I remember, um, at our church, we had this big tabernacle display and I was like, I have to go there every day. I've got to go there every single day and just pray and pray and pray. And in high school, my senior year, like I got half, I would, you know, do half a day, go to work. Um, so before work, I would go to the tabernacle at the time of campgrounds and pray there. And I just would try to always keep my relationship with God. And I fasted all the time. And so even at school, people would be like, are you fasting again? And I would be like, you're not supposed to say anything. Like, don't ask. Just if you see that I'm not eating, like, just leave me alone. You know, and they'd be like, you're going to get sick. You're going to like gymnastic practice and doing cross country and you haven't eaten all day. Like you're going to get sick. And I'd be like, I'll be fine. I'm fine. You know? Um, but I just like, at that point, like, I feel like God, because I was lacking in direction. He just guided me all along the way. And I knew that if I could just reach a place in prayer where I could get close to God, like I knew I would be okay. I knew that everything I was going through, that he would help me through it. And, you know, I, I just would hold on to those promises in God's word that, you know, you'll go through the fire and you won't come out being smelling like smoke, you know, you won't be burned that, you know, you can go through the waters and they're not going to overtake you. And I just would hold on to these scriptures. And to this day, I feel like those prayers that I prayed when I was younger have held on to me through some of the toughest times of my life. Um, because it doesn't get any easier. Life does not get any easier. The older you get, um, battles become harder and things become stronger that try to overtake you. But God is so steady and he's a strong tower and the righteous run into it and are safe. And I would hold on to those scriptures because I knew God, if you have given me this battle, I know that I can get through this because you've given it to me and you're going to give me the strength and the grace to do this. Your mercy is new every morning. Your grace is sufficient through every trial that I go through. And I'm sorry for getting emotional. Um, but no, life is not through rose colored glasses all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, people's social media accounts can be so false advertisement, you know, mm -hmm. just because you can dress well or you can do things well does not mean that you're not fought. And it doesn't mean that what you have has come easily because mm -hmm. everything I have, I feel like I have literally fought tooth and nail to, to have it. Mm -hmm. And you know, when, but God, what the thing about it is, is that God gives you his word and he gives you his presence to sustain you. And at the end of the day, I know that no matter what I go through, if I will hold on to his hand, that I will be okay. 
I listened to a sermon yesterday that um, Stephen Furtick was talking about that it said that when Peter walked on the water, he called out to Jesus and it says that Jesus, it didn't say that Jesus was near Peter, but that his hand reached out for him and quickly grabbed him when he called out for him. And he said that, you know, Peter was near Jesus. And so Jesus could quickly grab him. And I feel like no matter what you go through, you can go through the rockiest time of your life. But if you try to always stay near Jesus, he will grab you when you begin to sink. And there are so many times that I felt so far from God, so far from God, because I was so hurt by life and disappointment and things that have happened to my family and things that have happened to people that I deeply love and myself, things not working out the way I thought they would, me not being where I thought I should be, that I just had such a hard time believing because I cared so much. And I felt like sometimes I care anymore, then I'm going to be hurt even more with disappointment. So I'm just not going to care. I'm going to pretend like I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. You know, whatever. Life just stinks. Like life is just hard. Life just hurts. Life is so hard. I'm whatever. Like this is life. And I was okay with however things would happen. But I feel like those prayers that I prayed from years ago held on to me. And I remember God showing me so many dreams. Like God speaks to me in dreams through things and just that I would go through a really tough season. And, um, but I, I know that those prayers, it's almost like they go in time, like prayers are timeless. Prayers are timeless. And when you reach out for God and you're like, look, I know I haven't done the right thing, but if you're always in that point where you say, God, I have got to have your help. If you don't help me, I remember just not even being able to pray because I was so hurt. And I would just sit in the prayer room. I would go to pray and just sit in the prayer room and be like, God, I don't even know what to pray. I'm so broken. I don't even know what to say. I'm so hurt that I can't even see past this. That's all I have to offer. But I need your help. I have to have your help because I, I remember praying all the time in high school, like, God, I can't, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. Like that was my prayer all the time. I would sing it. God, I don't want you to have angels walk with me through the school. Like, cause I know I need it, but I want you to walk with me in my school and be a light for my school. Like you, I don't want the angels. I want your hand. And I feel like when you know that no matter how messed up you are, if you want the Lord, he wants you. He knows that you have mistakes and that there are things that you will not get right at times. He's infinite. He knows all things, but he knows that the true desire of your heart beyond the broken actions of your life, that they're pure. He will meet those desires. And if you just hang on, God will see you through. If you just never give up, I knew that. I'm, I don't give up. You know, that is never an option. You never give up. Giving up is not something we do. We don't give up. Like we as Christians, as me as a pastor's wife, me as a child of God, you don't give up. Even if you don't believe it, even if you don't know why you do things, you hold on and you do them until you figure out why. You never drop things that you were taught to do. You may not understand it, but they protect you. You may not understand at all for years and God may not reveal it to you for a long time, but if you were taught something your whole life, then you need to keep doing it because doing anything else is almost being done in rebellion. It may not, it may be okay for some people, you know, just like the scripture talks about um, when they were wanting to circumcise the, um, the Jewish people were circumcised, but any, the Gentiles were not, you know, and when the New Testament came and was written, they were trying to circumcise Gentiles. And then they were like, you know what? Jesus was like, no, that's not what you do. Like, this isn't what you do. Yes, this is what you've been taught, but don't put on them more than what I've called to put on them. And I feel like there may be new Christians that 
there are things that they aren't called to do and they may not feel like that's what they're supposed to do. But because we've been raised this way, this is what we do. We do it until, until we are not able to do it anymore and we're stopped breathing. We do this because this is what we were taught and mm -hmm. it protects us. It's what we're supposed to do. And I feel like there is such a power and anointing when you hang on and you do what you don't feel like you know to do and you do it anyway. There's such anointing in that and saying, I'm going to be faithful even when I don't know why I'm being faithful. I'm going to do this because this is why, because I've been taught to do it. And having the mentality of, I don't do this because I'm Pentecostal. No, that's not a thing. I do this because it protects me. And it has protected mm -hmm. me this long and it's going to continue to protect me. And no matter how much anyone else says it's not important, it can be not important to them, but it's protected me this far and I'm going to keep doing it. And all those saints before me, I respect. And there's a reason why they put this fence up. I'm not tearing it down. There's a reason. I may not know why exactly, but I'm not going to tear it down because this is why. And I feel like our approach can be different. Yeah, we can reach out to other churches differently. We can have lights. We can have other things. But there are some things that just don't change. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like as a person, you just have to figure out, I have to stand no matter what. And if this is what I've been taught to do to stand, I'm going to do it this way. That's so good. That's kind of my story. Wow. That was a lot of, like, wisdom that was just dropped on us. Thank I was you. just like absorbing all of that. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. You're welcome. Um, and, you know, I have to say when I, when I met you um, in Texas, I just remember thinking like you had such like a peace and like a joyfulness about you. And so I would never know that you went through so much you know throughout your life I would never be able to tell that because I feel like the peace of God is just over you and um so yeah thank God you know I feel like he really um did a work in your life and he definitely uses you um like I always say I feel like when I went there and I was able to meet you and everybody else but especially you I feel like I just learned a lot just being with you you're just a really sweet um, person. And um, I feel like the love of God really like shows through you and everything that you do. So I appreciate Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm so sorry this has been so long. <laughs> no, you're totally fine. Um, one of mine was like three hours because I had like seven guests at the same time. Oh, so, my word. Wow. Yeah, it was, <laughs> yeah, it was like a long episode. Um, but no, you're totally fine. Um, before we end, I wanted to talk about, for those of you that do not know, my sister is a part of a collaboration with um, a company that they used to just do like suit supply for men. Um, and now they branched out into making like women's clothing. And Brit is one of the first um like ambassadors for that so um Nicole was just telling me like Brit's like the model customer like we like Brit is like per the perfect like example of like what you like want your customer to be you know or what their style and stuff like that she was like so I just had to ask her to be an ambassador because I just love like her stuff um well, thank you so much yeah I love to be a part like and it's so awesome to be part of a brand that like you feel like represents you. So I'm, mm. I just love that. Like, I love that I can be a part of something that is so beautiful. Like their material is just fabulous. Their content, just, I love it all. So fabulous. Mm. I can't wait to see like what you do with the pieces and all that. Um, I think that'll be really cool. Um, so if you guys haven't checked that out, Make sure you guys go follow the page. I'll have it linked below. Um, yes, it's fabulous. But I'll also have all of um, Britt's information down below and just like all her different, um, you have like different pages for like your brands and stuff, right? Like your 
Yes. Baking so right that. now it's just for me, it's Charity Britain Jean. And then mm -hmm. for my cakes, it's a Jean Gâteau. And it's just my last name and cake in French. And it's actually on my Insta my personal Instagram in the um, bio. But it's about to merge. So be on the lookout for that. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. And thank you uh, for having just, me. Yeah. Thanks for just um, sharing your heart and um, just, I, like I said, just dropping so much wisdom on us. <laughs> Cause well, I'm it, so glad that I could. I love you, sister. And anybody I watching, like, we are in this together. This road is not meant to be done alone. Life is not meant to be done alone. We're better together. And if I can help in any way, I'm, I'm so glad to help. Well, you definitely did. Um, like I said, you know, I really enjoyed like what we talked about and I feel like people will really take something with them from, from watching this. Um, so yeah, I hope you guys uh, learned something and you'll kind of take some of these things with you um, after watching this and yeah, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, um, Kate. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye guys. Bye.